Okay, hello everyone, um, hello. and welcome to um, the Open Scholarship Forum. Uh, my name is Hardy Schwamm, I'm the Open Scholarship Librarian here in the library, and um, yeah, this event today is organized by the library, but with the help of many others, and that's great. Um, so I'm just going to uh, talk uh, you through what we're going to do um, in the next uh, 90 minutes. Um, so, um, so this is what we've planned. Um, uh, so there will be, well, as you can see, Jim is, is not here, or not here yet. So we're going to start with our lightning talks. We have five of them. Um, there will be roughly eight minutes each. And after that, we have a panel discussion, which will be moderated by our university librarian, John Cox. And, um, and that will then be open to a Q&A session. And then we finish um, with lunch outside in the uh, foyer. Um, I think there's not much else I need to say. Oh, yeah, so questions. So we have, as I say, five uh, lightning talks. Um, and I think because you know, we, we want to uh, give everyone kind of equal time and opportunity. We park the questions till the very end. Uh, so I hope, hope you're, you're okay with that and you remember, uh, you know, your, your question. Right, have I missed anything? Um, I think that, that's it. So with that, I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, introduce the, the first uh, speaker that we have this morning. Um, and okay. Uh, Louise, this slides up. Uh, Louise, are you going to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, one minute warning. Over seven minutes in, Louise, okay. if that's all right. Sure. Um, hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today, Hardy, and colleagues in the, in the library. Uh, so my name is Louise Hannon. I am head of research post award in the research office. And I'm going to give a brief overview of funder requirements in the area of open research. So our research community at the University of Galway are, are very proactive and successful at securing funding to progress their research um, from international and national and other European um, funding agencies. So I have on the screen here um, four of the funding agencies with whom we interact uh, um, quite broadly and who represent really um, the donors of up to 50% of our annual uh, research uh, contract value that we sign. So the role of the research funding agencies in securing this open research environment should not be underestimated. It is considerable. Um, because of the uh, requirements that they impose upon the funded researchers uh, can often change behaviour or, 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 or guide behaviour. And we can see the importance with which um, these funders are, are taken in the fact that they are a key stakeholder group. The Funders Forum is a key stakeholder group in the National Open Research Forum's work in their initial landscaping report. And you can see here I've just highlighted four of the, um, or, or the, the three um, national funders that we're going to look at today um, to see what their responses were when they were asked the question, do your policies or your processes support the open research or open access? And they've been answering the affirmative every time. Um, obviously, um, the European Commission, who is one of our major research funders as well, is not national, so I've so added here that they are also um, signatory to the uh, Declaration on uh, Research assess Assessment and, uh, and also would answer the affirmative if they had been included. So before I, just, before I start to review the, um, the funders and their requirements uh, individually, I wanted to just spend a moment <coughs> on terminology because I think that terminology can sometimes be it can be a little muddied, it can be varied uh, by our funders. Some funders talk of open access to publications, some talk of open access to research data, data sharing, open data, open scholarship, open science, and sometimes it gets confusing. I think the takeaway for me certainly is the word open. That is consistent. That is consistent across all of our funders. And also, if we would take something else away, it would be that by and large, Open research, open scholarship, open science are interchangeable. 
and they are an approach, an approach to open sharing <coughs> of research outputs. So I'm going to focus, I'm going to, I have on the screen here open science. Um, open science is the terminology that the European Commission has adopted um, when they are um, prescribing their requirements in terms of the open research agenda um, in their grant application. I chose um, the European Commission because their requirements are probably the most comprehensive and likely they will guide the way for our national funders. So I won't read this, but I'll give you a moment to read <laughs> the uh, open science. It's an approach. So now I'll move on to each of the, the funders that I wanted to talk about. The European Commission. The European Commission's requirements in terms of the open research agenda um, is, is encompassed under open science. They describe open science. And what they want is they want open access, which is a mandatory and immediate open access to publications. That's their requirement. That's what they want. Uh, data sharing. Data sharing it's a little woolier, but it is as open as possible and as close as necessary. We have to respect our, our intellectual property rights here. The European Commission are unique in that they, within open science, within their requirements for the open research or open science, they also bring in engagement. So they want to see what we're proposing in terms of the engagement of citizens, civil society, and end users. So they've, they've broadened. The, the, the remit, we'll say, of open research already. So in our funding proposals to Horizon Europe or to the European Commission, we must make sure that we outline, and now our applications are only 45 pages long, um, and one of them are given over to open science, what our proposals are in terms of open science, and one page is given over to what our proposals are in terms of data management. The two are, are, are inextricably linked. Um, Open Research Europe, I just would comment here. Many of the funders have their own research, uh, their own publishing platforms now, and kind of confusingly, they call them things like Open Research. So Open Research Europe is a publishing platform by the European Commission. You don't have to publish there, but it's a facility for those who are funded um, to by the European Commission to publish. So SFI. SFI's open research requirements are under the banner of open research. But within this, um, they have a policy on open access and a policy on research data management. And again, their move is towards all outputs, um, all outputs resulting from publicly funded research should be available almost immediately. So this is what Plan S. They're a signatory to Plan S, and, and that's what they require. Um, we're bound by the terms and conditions of the grant agreements that we sign with them, and in there again it is reinforced this commitment to, to open access in terms of publication. Research data management. Many of the applicate or many of the applications to um, to SFI now will also require a description of how you're going to manage your data. You must describe what your approach to data sharing is, to how open your data is. Um, and if you're not going to make it open, then why? HRB is another one of our main funders. Open access is the banner on which they address the issues surrounding uh, open research. And again, they have a requirement that all researchers are required to deposit their publications in whole or in part in um, open access repositories. Again, it's reinforced by our commitments that we sign in terms of the, or in the, the grant agreements in our terms and conditions. Um, they have two policies, one on open access and one on the sharing of research data. Um, again, it is a, maybe a, a get out clause here because we're talking about health research, but again, the, the, the policy is that it is shared, the research data is shared with as few restrictions as possible. So the final funder that we were looking at was the IRC, and the IRC have comprehend have, uh, under the banner of open access is where they have their requirements in terms of the open research environment. Um, they um, have a comprehensive policy in terms of open access, um, and again, there's a condition where council-funded recipients must lodge their publications and all of the research outputs in open access repositories. 
So again, it's reinforced here. And similar to SFI, um, at application stage, they want us to demonstrate what our plan is in terms of our data management, how open we're going to make it, and if we're not, then why? So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Louise. And uh, we're now kind of from, from the big picture of policies, we're kind of zooming in to uh, the kind of research life of an individual. So, Kira, tell us all about how open scholarship improves your research. Thanks a million. So, I'm going to take a bit more of a selfish view of open scholarship. So what does it do, do for me anyway? Um, so just a little bit of context, I'm a lecturer in the School of Psychology, new enough, uh, here about two years. I'm going to talk about the ways that everything Louise just spoke about benefits me. Can I get the paper to work? I can. Uh, so Louise very thankfully kind of gave an overview of what's under that umbrella, but these are the things we think about when we think open science, so open access, open data, <coughs> open source, open materials, and pre-registration which I'll explain in a moment for those of you who don't know it. Uh, similarly, I'm going to say open scholarship, science, and research very interchangeably, so I mean the same thing when I say any of them. Uh, so when Hardy asked me to do this talk, he was like, how does open scholarship benefit you? And it really gave me a bit of a thinking moment, uh, and it took me a while to come up with this. So come up with three broad themes that all interplay. So the first is collaborations, because Open scholarship being part of this community has helped me a lot in that regard. Then there's the obvious kind of research quality and publications. And the last one is just what I think is, can be called a better culture and happier researchers. So I think the kind of improvements that are made benefit us all individually. So in terms of collaborations, open scholarship tends towards the, what's called big team science. So we have a lot more people working together, usually internationally with inclusivity in terms of who can be involved and transparency regarding authorships. So as opposed to what would maybe traditionally be the model where if you're looking for a collaborator, collaborator you seek out who's the most influential in the field, open scholarship tends towards a, hey, we need lots of people to work on this, who wants to be involved? So you get a lot more PhD students, things like that, able to make these connections. So my first job post-PhD was at the University of Oxford, and I was part of one of these huge collaborations, so it spans, I think, three continents, a lot of different countries. And this was absolutely brilliant for me for the career stage I was at. So this job, I was mostly just data collecting, collecting constantly and doing stats, but it meant I got to make these connections broadly across. This consortium was also very dedicated to open scholarship in that all the materials and data we collected was fully open, um, and this led to me making even further connections as people would reach out and use it. So when I moved to Galway, I was then in a much smaller team, and kind of, as you know, first lectureship, PI, you're on your own. So I sought out some different collaborations I could make. So the first is what's called SIPS, Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, and they focus on issues regarding reprodu reproducibility and things like that. So I reached out to them, and they were like, love to have you involved, do some work with us. Another was the Psych Science Accelerator, which is very similar, where people propose experiments they want to do, and collaborators from lots of different countries join in. A key part of all of these is that you know from the get-go what your authorship position is. So you say, I want to be involved. They're like, that's great. This is what, you know, what your contribution will be. So it's, again, that inclusivity, inclusivity and transparency. And the last thing I got involved in quite recently is FORT, which some of you may be aware of. So that's a framework for open and reproducible research and teaching. And again, they do research regarding reproducibility in teaching and also in research. So I'm working on a systematic review of the open scholarship landscape at the moment. Same thing, anyone can join in and you know from the get-go where you start. So I said I'd talk to you guys about pre-registration. So for those of you who don't know, the simplest form of pre-registration is where you say, before you start your data collection, exactly what you're going to do, and it's put in a date stamp repository, so that once you publish your data, people can go back and say, see that you did what you said you would. A registered report is the most extreme version of a pre-registration. 
So this would be where, instead of the usual scientific pipeline, where you do a full study and then submit it to a journal, you make your plan, you write your introduction, and then at that point you submit it to a journal. You go through peer review there, and they essentially evaluate your plan, so what, what you're going to do and why. At that point, they can either accept or reject, and if it's accepted, they say that if you run the study, as you said, they will, you will, they're going to publish your paper regardless of what you find. So, that's quite nice on two fronts. The first is that you get additional expert opinion on your paper, okay? So the peer review process becomes a bit nicer in that regard, in that you're getting someone to actually suggest things you could improve when there's still time to do so. Which again, early career researcher, it's great, you're gonna miss things. Uh, and the second is that the paper cannot be rejected due for having null findings. So there's no incentive to kind of spin your paper a certain way, whatever you find is in the journal. And as an early career researcher, it means you're not gonna put in a lot of effort to then have kind of wasted work if you can't get there afterwards. Um, so that's just an example of a registered report from that consortium. So as you can see, we had open materials data and was pre-registered. Um, and it's quite a nice paper for us to get out. The other thing is preprints. Uh, so this kind of comes back actually again to something Louise was saying. These are versions of your paper you put up before it's been accepted in a journal. And so you can put this on something like OSF or a preprint repository. Um, and it's good in a couple of ways. That increases your audience and citations. Essentially, you can put it up on Twitter twice when it's accepted and <laughs> beforehand. Um, again, the research community broadly can give you a bit of input before it's published. Um, and the research gets out faster given the current delays in peer review. So this is a preprint I've had up for, I think, over a year now. Um, on a preprint server like this, you get a DOI, it's fully citable, like a real paper. Uh, but it accounts for the fact that this paper has been under review for over a year now. It's had some positive <laughs> review ones, but it's just everyone knows the delays at the moment. So it doesn't stall you. If you're applying for jobs, it's on your CV. The last bit I said I'd talk about was our better culture and happier researchers. Smell the faces all around. So registered reports. I kind of alluded to this a minute ago, but it's just a nicer feeling process. So it becomes a bit collaborative with your reviewers. They'll say, maybe you could do this, maybe you could do that. And when you get that at the end of the process, you're like, oh god, well, you hate my experiment. When you get it before you start data collection, you're like, that's a good idea, I could do this. And generally gets rid of a lot of anxiety around the process for early career researchers. The other is a lot of these online communities where people can access help and support in learning new things. And I always like to end on this metaphor of the open scholarship buffet. So you don't need to try and do everything. You don't need to be the perfect open researcher. Take and choose what suits you. Serve yourself first. And whatever ways you engage with open science or scholarship, do it in ways that are going to help you, and you'll be making a positive impact in general. So thank you very much, and I'll hear any questions at the end. And uh, it's good to hear all the benefits, and I guess now with Siobhan we might um, also hear about some challenges, um, but... Uh Over to you. Hi, Kevin. So my talk today is research data management in our lab, expectations and reality. My name is Siobhan Gohan. I'm a program manager in the molecular parasitology lab based here in the University of Galway in the Ormson building. Um, I'd like to thank Harvey Schwamm and uh, Trish Feynman for all the mentorship and resources um, that has helped us um, uh, manage our data management and for continued support into 2023. I'm going to talk about our research team and our project quickly. So this is Professor John Dalton, Professor of Parasitology. He's our leader in the lab. And then this is our 2023 team of scientists. So we have postdocs, <coughs> research assistants, and um, one PhD student and a master's student as well. And a number of master's students coming in over the summer as well. Then these are our past team members from 2019 and into 2021. 
Um, all of whom have now secured permanent roles within other institutions in the UK and in Ireland. So our project um, the vision is to design a novel, novel methods to prevent parasitic infection of humans and their livestock. And this is focusing on um, fasciola hepatica and the liver fluke um, parasite. And the liver fluke infects cattle and sheep in Ireland and costs the economy about €90,000 per year. 90, 000, yeah per year um, in reduced milk and meat production and also in the cost of dosing animals with chemicals. So um, uh, the, uh, the life cycle of the parasite is quite complicated, it involves a number of different animals, I'm not going to go into the, all the nitty gritty of it, and the cycle can take about 18 to 20 weeks. So um, the project then um, is a complicated project with four work packages extending over five years with many stages and going from the vaccine discovery and development stage and into the translational stage. This project will generate multiple data sets and this can quickly get out of hand. So this word cloud illustrates many of the data sets um, that will be produced in the project and are produced in the project. It's a complicated mess. For example, we produce many genomic uh, sequence data sets that require curation and need to be available to everyone. Therefore, it's essential to have a good ma data management system. So research data management, what are the expectations? The expectations are that at the end of a project, or when a paper is published in the public domain, that our research samples, protocols, and data sets are made available in an open access format to allow other research scientists to reproduce or analyze the work and to build upon it. However, the reality is the countless research data sets are left in lab books, left on laboratory shelves, in USB keys and onto um, hard drives and personal computers and are inaccessible to scientists within the team and outside the team and in the wider um, scientific uh, community. So the goals of good research data management are to ensure data is uh, collected, curated, stored, archived and made accessible and reusable. And this maximises the value of the data. So the reality of research data management. So um, we developed a data management plan with the help of the library staff here and the, it was developed to set out the practicalities of managing project data for our team. In a, following the FAIR guidelines so that findable, accessible, interoperable, and can be reused. So, um, in order to implement the data management plan that we created, we created three separate procedures to complement the, the DMP. So, how to fill out a lab notebook properly, very important. How to name data set files and store them on Microsoft Teams, and how to complete a read me text file for research data sets. A read me text file um, is a file that helps a person to make sense of the data set that is located in a folder um, and it sets out the file structure and the identity of the files within the, these folders. We have developed um, a, a template or uh, adapted a template that we found from the Harvard site to help us with this. So, um, to be successful, data management must be integrated and managed as an intrinsic part of the daily workflows within the lab. And in order to do so, it's easily and practical, practically, we use Microsoft Teams, which is provided by the university, it's backed up by the university, and it's linked to uh, SharePoint and also to OneDrive and backed up on the servers. There's also um, a possibility of getting extra space on servers um, um, and ISS can allow you to do that to make an extra copy of all the data and all this information is available on the library website. So in the School of Natural Sciences are now embracing this method of raw data storage and backup thanks to a recent talk by Professor Alan Ryder who delivered as part of the weekly Friday seminar series to the whole School of Natural Sciences. <coughs> so back to our lovely word cloud again. So this is our data mess that needs to be organised. And um, uh, so to do that, we use, as I said, Microsoft Teams. So every scientist has a group channel. And in the channel, 
there are um, uh, sorry a group and in the group there are channels and in the channels there are files and folders um, the terminology is a little bit confusing but um, anyway it's basically folders into which you put the data and each person um, each scientist has one of these channels or there can be a group of channels where a number of scientists have access and the PI has access at all time and the data man manager has access at all time thus um, allowing the data to be um, it's not locked, it's not stuck on someone's computer ok so and again the data has to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary so since um, 2019 the, the group have published up to 30 papers and um, 23 of these papers and reviews the data has been included in the manuscript manuscript or supplementary data. With seven of the papers, um, the data sets are deposited in open five different open access repositories that are subject, subject specific to um, parasitology. You see the names of them here. And um, so um, some of the papers have been cited up to 29 times that the papers that have been in the data depositories and the data sets created by the lab are used by teams in Mexico, UK, Ireland, Switzerland, China, Australia, Uruguay, and Russia. So this illustrates the fair principles and practice. So they're findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable <coughs> like other things throughout the world. So what are the barriers? So <coughs> the barriers would be access to resourcing and support in order to implement um, data management, <coughs> and also a willingness all scientists to share the results, reagents, samples, and protocols. With regard to samples, there's also added uh, complications such as material transfer agreements, import export duties, um, licensing for sending certain samples to certain countries. Um, also, said that some scientists are reluctant to engage with the process. That definitely is a barrier. And the time it takes to get organized. And then again, the protection of intellectual property, both foreground and background. So what can we do about that? Then I, I suppose just more further education and training in good research data management will help together with resourcing and practical tools to break down the current obstacles. So I thank you for listening. This is a um, photograph of our team who were at the Science Fair in November. Um, I'd also like to thank special thanks to Eve, Icy, and Hazus for helping uh, to develop the data management plan and for uh, the SOPs and helping to implement it across the team and to Dr. Christina Krekolinski for helping to provide some data about the um, published data. And I'd like to leave you with a wee picture of Fasciola Hepatica. Um, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Right, so, uh, so far we've been uh, mainly co uh, covered the um, sciences, and now um, we're kind of switching, sorry, not done. So Dan, uh, what's Dan? I'm oh, sorry, you, you are next, sorry. Mm -hmm. So Dan Carey here, um, obviously director of the Moore Institute, you don't have uh, slides, so I just uh, put this up, so that's okay. Uh, the floor is here. Sorry, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stand. Um, yeah, in addition to being uh, director of the Moore Institute, I'm also chair of the Irish Research Council, so I have a dual perspective. But I am going to talk particularly about the implications for the humanities of uh, open access, and without wishing to be too discordant to raise some concerns or issues that I think have been unresolved. Specifically, I want to talk about the National Open Research Forum North, um, and its, uh, its action implementation plan. And we've had quite a few meetings with uh, colleagues there um, uh, in the context of the Irish Research Council, also the Royal Irish Academy. And we, as we're hearing from Louise, there's kind of mandating here. It's well embedded in, in, in processes and practice. And I think there's a broad consensus, you know, at the EU international level and certainly national level that uh, widening access to research is, is a very positive thing. I don't think anybody's opposed to that. Um, so I'll make some observations on the North Action Plan, which people may not have studied in great detail, because uh, it's one of those documents which one tends not to. Um, it references a culture change, um, but there's no discussion of how the new system is going to be funded. That would seem to me to be a, a problem uh, with it. 
Um, so there's some discussion of staffing associated with infrastructure and the training that will be necessary in order to um, create the new academic self, to borrow from Harvey's <laughs> title. Um, and there's certainly a potential burden on funding agencies, but it's not really resolved in terms of how we actually then do this and how we're going to achieve it. Um, just to give us some points of reference, um, UKRI, which is you know the funding body in the UK that amalgamates all of the different agencies, um, has an open access policy, which was adopted in August 2021. And it includes a requirement for monographs, book chapters, and edited collections published from 1 January 2024 to be made open access within 12 months of publication. Um, if that's the direction of travel, it's very significant. It's very striking that monographs, edited collections, are essentially ignored in North. And that's been kicked to an implementation phase, and trust me, I have raised this issue at every available opportunity. But all the difficult stuff is just left to a future implementation moment, which is, I guess, a utopian stage in which, um, like the communist state, we all cease to labor and you know, life is perfect and wonderful. But to give you some kind of uh, frame of reference, UKRI has indicated that it's going to have a dedicated fund of 3.5 million per year to support monograph, book chapters, and edited collections from this implementation date. Um, there's been an independent study conducted in 2017, actually, which said that there would be, need to be 19.2 million per year. That's interesting because that's pegged to REF. That's not funding agencies requiring it. That's REF requiring 75% of all books and monograph uh, books and collections monographs to be open access. Now, why 75%? We maybe come back to that. But there's obviously a gap, even in a well-funded system. Um, we know what the difficulties are in Ireland. Uh, should we really expect that there's going to be that degree of largesse? I'm not so sure. Um, what's the plan with uh, early career researchers? I'd like to know. Um, if they're unaffiliated to institutions, if they're on temporary contracts, how are they going to be enfranchised in the system? Are they expected to come up with article processing charges? Do they have to come up with grants? If so, how is that going to be managed? Um, but it's not just early career researchers. What about independent scholars? What about part-time or precariously employed people? What about retired academics? Um, that's part of the ecology of research in the humanities, and I think it's one of the things that we've done remarkably well, but it will be set aside in this process, potentially, so we need to think about it. Um, there's an emphasis in the North document on academic freedom. That is entirely welcome. Um, but are we at risk of creating a system in which academic freedom and freedom is under threat? Because there's a scenario in which institutions or governments uh, cover the costs of publications, and then they have their own priorities. It would be grossly naive not to entertain that thought. Um, what's the impact on learned societies? Uh, they often make considerable income from journals. That income is then recirculated in many different ways, but often in terms of small grants for people for library fellowships and other things. And those are all parts of the ecology here that we're potentially moving away from, but we don't have a solution for that. But because it's not important, because it's a STEM-led, it won't be attended to. Um, are we, and this is the most serious question I want to raise today, are we effectively endorsing a system in which, or, in order to gain access to publication, you have to have a research grant. Is that what we're contemplating? Well, a lot of the answers are not provided in North Action Plan, as I see it. Uh, what are the implications for scholars in the global south? If the norm is to uh, achieve publications and it depends on open access, are we unwittingly imposing a system in which it's it places an impossible burden on scholars who are coming from places that are less well funded? Uh, Ireland would be relatively privileged, but we all already know what the risks would be here. Another issue that hasn't been addressed in Ireland is, is trade books. Um, those are for a wider audience. Uh, the UK has deliberated over this question. And what they say is the decision on whether, uh, this is UKRI's policy, the decision on whether a book should be considered a trade book or an academic monograph is at the discretion of the author and publisher. Well, at the moment, in the UK, at the moment, trade books are exempted. I'd like to know why. What's the, the rationale for excluding a trade book? The other things that are excluded are scholarly, this is in the UK now, scholarly editions, exhibition catalogs, illustrated catalogs, textbooks, all types of fiction works and creative writing. Well, that's, that's jolly interesting. But what's the basis for that? I don't understand it. 
So I have colleagues, and my appointment is in English, colleagues there who, who write novels. Why aren't those open access? If they're employed by the state, and the argument for this is that you're funded by the state, that's a pretty clear logic. So there's some weird things going on as I see it, which we've not really seen. <coughs> okay, fiction, poetry, drama. Well, if we're going to take this further, what about if somebody, I don't know, makes a film? We have a film school here. We all go along there for free because it's open access. So we've exempted various things, but without thinking about the implications and why we're doing that. Another point that hasn't been addressed in North, what about differential rates of publication? There are huge differences of rate of publication between STEM and AHSS. Well, if institutions are covering the cost, if funding agencies are covering the cost, I don't know, what are the implications of that? Um, there's a variety of other things. I roll, I roll is one solution of a kind, uh, but it's not really a solution because it's really just creating an IRL bias in the system, which is a, a point that Monica Crump made at a recent meeting. Um, so where's the money going to come from? Is it going to come from the state? Is it going to come from funding agencies? Um, if it's going to come from institutions, we have our own experience of Rig Ram. I wouldn't be optimistic. I wouldn't be optimistic. Um, what are the systems of sustainability that we're going to build in here? I think we're in danger of eroding things which are pretty well in place. I could give you an example at, at, at further length, but I don't have the time, but of a, an addition that I'm involved in, which will be part of Oxford Scholarship Online. Oxford Scholarship Online will maintain the platform. I'm jolly glad that they will. I can't hand that over to Galway to do. It's not realistic. So there are forms of sustainability that are predicated on commercial models, which we are in danger of eroding. Uh, and then finally, this is to some extent a minor point, is really that how to manage third-party third materials that are in open access publications that hasn't been solved. Um, and then just a final point, because so much of our collaboration, uh, and we should really do a census of this post-Brexit, is with UK institutions. But UKRI mandates, if anybody in the UK is involved in that, it will be open access. So what are the implications for that? What are the implications for international publishers in this? Very little attention to US publishers and where they fit in. So while we're busy remaking the world, I think we're also forgetting about a lot of the stuff which is, has been developed because of the ecology of research. I think there may be, there may be a future which is bright, sunny uplands, and all those good things, but I worry about how we get to that space and how we create a norm which is predicated on one form of academic research within the institution and not another. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. And uh, so the, I think I'm going to actually pick up on a couple of points you just made with my. So I'm the last uh, lightning talk. Um, just let me get going. So I'm going to talk about our open access publishing agreements. And I know some of the uh, um, colleagues here in the room have, have used them. And I'm going to talk about, well, hopefully some success, but also some challenges. Um, so, But to start with, what are these agreements? Um, first, there's more terminology here, because sometimes they're called transformative agreements, or they're called transitional agreements, or read and publish. But the idea be behind all this terminology is that the subscription expenditure that we mainly have in the library here, um, that uh, money is repurposed uh, to support open access publishing and thereby transforming uh, business models of journals. Um, and this is based on the understanding that there is enough money globally in the uh, system um, through, um, at the moment, subscription um, to cover the cost of open access publishing. So the idea is not to just kind of spend more and more, but to use the existing money in a different way. Now, um, we have at the moment 24 of those agreements in place, and these agreements cover about 61% of papers that are authored by Irish, uh, Irish corresponding authors, and that makes, in terms of we have a ranking of transformative or open access agreements, makes Ireland number six in the world at the moment. And uh, on that kind of uh, uh, graph, you can see the publishers and their share of the market. And you can see it's dominated by what's called the big five. And all of them are 
part of our open access agreement and just so the big five are Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, Taylor and Francis, which is this <coughs> mother company is called Informa, and Sage. How do these agreements work? Um, they are um, negotiated by the national consortium, IRL, that Dan just uh, mentioned. And at the moment, um, these agreements uh, together um, cover just under 11,000 journals. And eligible are University of Galway corresponding authors, um, so that's student and staff. So anyone with uh, an active uh, affiliation can publish and use these agreements. Um, now, most of these agreements um, of those 24 are capped by an annual maximum number of APCs we can um, uh, support, and they are handed out on a first-come, first-served basis. Now, that leads me to um, the challenge of those agreements. There's a lot of complexity, which we are aware of, and we understand that this is often confusing to to our academics and other authors. So the capped agreements, that's a big one. So uh, for example, the Elsevier agreement is the number of APCs <coughs> is based on 70% of publications we have published with Elsevier in the previous year. So that meant that in last year, our funds were exhausted in September. And for Springer, it's similar, the funds were exhausted in <coughs> August. Um, now, some of the agreements are unlimited, so there is some good news. So, for example, um, Cambridge University Press, PLOS, and SAGE. Um, these agreements, they don't cover, so if there's a big publisher with thousands of journals, they don't cover all of the titles. And often, the so-called premium titles are excluded. Um, and if we have a pot for gold open access journals, that's often a separate pot for journals that publish 100% open access, that pot is often much smaller than the hybrid one. So you can see there's, there is complexity here. And I've done some analysis of what happened in the last two years with these agreements when we had them in place. So first, have a look at the, the top one. The top graph that tells you how much in total the, the institution publishes gold open access so these are publications that are available at the publisher open access. So in 21, that was just over 1,000 publications. And uh, last year it was 1,100 uh, and so on. You can see that makes uh, of around 40 to 45% of the total of what we publish is available open access at the publisher. Now, these agreements that I've just told you about, they supported in 21, 328 and uh, last year 390 publications, so roughly about a third of the total that we have up there. Um, how much are they worth? Just to, for you to know, if we base this on what uh, the University of Cambridge estimates as an average APC of just under 2,000 euros, so that makes our agreements worth over 600,000 euros in 21 and just under 720,000 last year. Now, who of the publishers uh, kind of hands them out? So just to get a, a sense of where these uh, free, like included APCs come from. So the big one is Elsevier, with uh, you know quite a distance um, to to the other big five, followed by then the other publishers. Just to so see, so um, the big five cover more than three quarters of all the the kind of. APCs, the publications that are supported by our agreements at the moment. So the next thing I'm going to show you is how um, these APCs are distributed among our colleges. So first, this is overall the total of uh, publications produced by the four colleges. Um, so uh, you can see uh, the College of Medicine is the, the biggest one, followed by the others you can see here. So that's the overall total. Now I'm going to show you who gets, uh, who benefits from the APCs. And um, there is a big winner here, and it's maybe not surprising. So the red is the uh, APCs and the percentage compared with the overall production of so you can see science and engineering is the big winner. Um, and you can also see, maybe also not surprising, um, if we know how the arts uh, and social sciences and where they're published, 
they benefit kind of the least. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the current situation. And to show you which schools get um, benefit from them, so what, from what I sh uh, showed you, that's maybe not a surprise. So um, it's the big winners again are medicine and engineering, and that's followed. So here are all the, the, the schools that get 10 or more um, APCs through these deals in the last year. Okay, so then um, to summarize the kind of pros and cons of these agreements, um, the um, open access agreements, they, they do help authors who, who can't afford APC. So you don't have to have a research budget uh, to, to benefit from them. There are kind of, they're quite easy for authors to use because they're part of the publisher's um, workflow and require little admin. Um, and as I've shown you, all the big publishers and some important smaller ones are covered. So that's all good. The cons are, is you know, from what I've shown you, you will see these agreements will not achieve the 100% open access uh, uh, goal that we have and that also North uh, has um, told us that that's the goal. So that won't happen through um, open access agreements. There is a limited number of uh, publishers covered and we will not ever cover all of them because there's just too many. <laughs> um, and most of the agreements are capped, um, which means authors cannot rely on uh, the support through these agreements. And um, they're also, and we're talking about research papers mainly here, so long form publications, we heard about the problem with monographs, they're not part of, of this. Okay, so then finally, what's the future of these agreements? Um, so on the right hand side, you, you can see a tweet from the Coalition S, um, which uh, confirms that their financial <coughs> support for these agreements will end after 2024. Now, so we heard that from Louise that SFI is, is um, part of this Coalition S. And what that means for, uh, for these agreements, we don't actually know at the moment because the IRON funding, where um, most of these the agreements are covered, is not directly linked to, to Plan S or Coalition S, but the overall direction of travel is really influenced by these uh, European policies. Um, and I think that the move towards open access uh, business models uh, that we'll see is um, linked not to the big commercial publishers. We'll see a, a, a wider, um, 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 yeah, we will see other models, for example, Diamond Open Access. Okay, so that's, that's me. Thank you very much.